I want to thank you all for coming. I'm very flattered to see not very many empty seats. Uh, so my name is Tim Bond. Uh, I'm from Seattle. I work for McGraw-Hill, the company that you probably remember seeing the red logo on in your textbooks back in the day. Uh, we're uh, mostly digital now, and so I get to work on our fun authoring platform. And we do have a lot of APIs, and uh, that's part of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so I started my PHP development back in 2004. Uh, I thought it would be a good idea to learn a programming, a programming language, and PHP was all the rage at that time, so that's what I started working with. Uh, fast forward today, I'm still working with it. Uh, I develop a lot of APIs uh, for my job. I consume them as part of my job and uh, just for fun in the free time to get data that I like. Uh, I'm a front-end developer when I have to be, but I don't really consider myself so much as a front-end person. I very much enjoy all the back-end. Uh, I am not a lawyer, I'm not a security expert, I'm not a penetration tester, although it might kind of sound like it after we get through some of this. Uh, I don't know everything. This talk is really just going to be uh, about things that I've seen uh, and things that I talk about, that I can talk about. And when I say that uh, we have a law in the US that prohibits anyone from decompiling or decrypting uh, someone else's application. And so theoretically what I would be able to talk about is not something I could ever have done. So we're gonna talk about uh, maybe some laboratory exercises that I did and definitely not uh, any live applications out there. Uh, so like I said, um, a lot of that comes from uh, mobile apps that I use. Um, although a lot of this uh, information is still going to be applicable to web APIs that you might use or see in a browser, uh, or also machine-to-machine uh, -machine applications. So for example, when you have one web service call another to get some data. Uh, so this is not gonna be a hacking workshop. I'm not gonna go through some of the uh, apps that we would use to go and attack someone's app. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to answer every single question that you might have about API security. Uh, I don't want this to be the only thing you ever uh, think about about API security. Um, I'm not really targeting what, we, what I would call a SaaS API or a software as a service. So if you think about companies like Stripe or Twilio where their business is selling their API, uh, that's a much different security talk than we're talking about this. And I want to think about more where um, you use an API as the course of, and through the course of your business to run your business and not so much that it is your business. So uh, I mentioned um, some of the APIs that we're going to talk about. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page here about what we would consider an API, uh, your web app might have uh, some APIs that it would call for, uh, to get data for the user. Uh, definitely mobile apps are always going to be interacting with APIs to get to uh, the data from various services. Um, but I don't want you to overlook AJAX endpoints that would just be powering uh, a website. Although those aren't typically considered a uh, API, it can be used uh, to get data in the same way. Um, also, partner integrations and internal integrations. This is uh, kind of those machine-to-machine -machine APIs that I was talking about. Um, internal integrations are one you want to be especially careful about because it's usually you know, uh, an API that you might use with another team to help support another application. And then uh, maybe one of your customers wants to have access to the data, uh, and then later you decide, oh, we'll just make that API public. And when it was easy and you could just talk to the other developers down the hall, uh, the security implementations were a lot less than when you're all of a sudden exposing it out to the internet. Um, also, in some ways, we consider a, a web page to actually be a form of an API, which we're going to talk about at the very end. So why would someone go and attack your API? Uh, it could just be that they want to know some more about what kind of data you have out there, or it could be that they're trying to get um, somewhat of a copy of your database that your API is uh, powering. Uh, it could be one of your competitors that wants to know more about your customers. Uh, it could be uh, someone that has a grudge against you, maybe for firing them, or uh, potentially one of your customers that wants to uh, overtake you. Um, another is that there's just no other way to get uh, some of the data that you might have as your company. You, uh, for example, if your company uh, collects a lot of data and processes things and you're really the only person in the industry that has that, uh, they might go after that because that data is then valuable because you have it. Um, another really popular one is people trying to build robots uh, against your data. They might uh, then go against that API to go and get that. Um, this is another interesting one that uh, a friend of mine experienced in that uh, he wanted to sort of run analytics on a company's data, and so he applied for an API key and they rejected him. Uh, and so what he ended up doing is using the API key that was on the company's homepage for a demo of the API to then uh, continue to do that. So 
Uh, and lastly, uh, to automate repetitive tasks. And I can't mention automation without showing the XKCD uh, for automation. So yeah, this, this graph is more relatable to me than I feel like it should be. Uh, so I know we're just after lunch, and if some of you might want to take a snooze, just uh, listen to this slide, and then you can uh, have a snooze until the end of the talk. Uh, so if there's anything you want to remember, that you should limit your API responses to have only the data you need to make your application work. And only who needs to see that data should be able to be seeing it. One user should not be able to view another user's data. With this, you want to have some ongoing monitoring, uh, both automated and human-assisted. So for example, if there's a spike in traffic, that should be waking someone up in the middle of the night and uh, using my very favorite app on my phone called PagerDuty. So code bugs are definitely responsible for the vast majority of all sorts of leaks that come through with APIs. So usually these types of things, when there is a breach, they're not very well discussed because a company doesn't really want to admit that they were at fault or exactly how the data was breached. But we do know that in 2018, there was a breach uh, from the Google Plus uh, social networking site. And in that, there were over 50 million users whose data was leaked. And the information that was on there is the information that you would see when you would visit someone's profile. So with Google Plus being a single page app, you go and click on someone's name, it brings up their profile and, and some information about them. Well, this was the Ajax endpoint that was on there. Uh, the problem with this was that someone found out that you could just put any ID in that same endpoint and just iterate through their entire database and get a list of everyone who had signed up for this. Uh, they did not have any sort of protection on there, and that's how someone was able to basically get a copy of the database without having to hack into their servers and you know, export a copy from the actual database. So let's take a look at a mobile app that uh, someone, uh, a business might have, and sort of go through how we would go about attacking that if we were the attacker. So for this particular app, it belongs to a retail store that, has, uh, that sells goods in their store. And if you go around with this app, you can scan the barcodes on various different products. And if you scan 10 of them, the shop will give you a $2 or two pound coupon. And so we see when we open up the app, we have all the items in there that we can scan. We'll hit the scan button on one of those. It'll bring up that with the camera. We scan the barcode, and then that counts towards uh, one of our 10. And so you might think, this is a mobile application. It's not like I'm in my browser where I can open the developer tools and see all the requests going by. And so it probably doesn't matter what's in there because nobody can see it. But it's actually quite easy to get access to seeing what's actually being transmitted over the wire. So the first thing you might do is you would set up a packet sniffer. So if, uh, if you've ever used Wireshark, that'd be a good start. Uh, the thing is with Wireshark is it's not going to be able to uh, decrypt any of the HTTPS stuff. So if the API was just over plain HTTP, all the packets would come through and that would look uh, just great. So the countermeasure for that would be to upgrade your API to use HTTPS. So that way if someone was using a packet sniffer, they would just see those TLS packets going by and while that is technically decryptable, the amount of work that it is to go through and do that is sufficient that uh, for pretty much everyone using the web, they would consider that to, rate, had to be a non-issue. So if you then have an HTTPS API, well, what's the attacker going to do next? Is they're going to set up a man-in-the-middle attack. And what this means is they will set up a proxy server, either on the device or on a separate device that it connects to, and uh, it will then the app will connect to that proxy instead of directly to your API, and the proxy is exposing its own secure certificate, and it's then able to decrypt the request that it's getting from the API, and then it will then forward that back onto the API. Uh, this will allow you to really see the entirety of all the traffic that's going through. So the countermeasure to this would be to use certificate pinning, and what this means is in your mobile app, you would store a copy of the public key of that certificate. So that way, when the app makes the request to that server, if the public key doesn't match, it will then reject the request, and it, will not, uh, it won't actually make that connection. Uh, this is only a thing in mobile apps. This is, uh, used to be an option in browsers, but it had been removed because there were too many security implementation, uh, implications uh, with people sending forged headers across and making this uh, pretty useless. Uh, 
Of course, we can always bypass that certificate pinning um, by using some instrumentation on the device that would intercept those calls and uh, tell it not to actually do that check to see if the keys matched. Uh, so to counter that, we might do some dynamic integrity checking, which would mean that the app at runtime would go through and it would look at the environment that it's running in and see if some of those libraries that do those checks, uh, maybe we'd take all the code uh, that's compiled and do a SHA sum of it and then compare that to a known value, sort of a code signing. Um, also on an Android device, if the device has been rooted, this is primarily the way that you're gonna be able to do that instrumentation on there. So you could check to see if the device had been rooted. Uh, some of the most popular apps out there, like Netflix and Pokemon Go, actually do check uh, when the app starts up to see if the device has been rooted, and if it has, then the app just flat out will not run. Uh, I caution this because there are kind of two things around that, and that one is that not everyone roots their phone because they want to hack. Some people might be running old, unsupported hardware, or uh, old, old hardware that is no longer supported by the manufacturer, and so they're running a third-party OS so that they can continue to receive security updates from the OS. Um, and also, um, uh, there was a package on Android that uh, when you installed it to gain that root access, one of the things that would happen when the app checked to see if the device was rooted, the uh, root app would then look at the package name of who is requesting to ask if I'm rooted, and if it was for, say, Netflix, then you would say no, but if it was maybe the Adbox software, you would say yes. So that is also something that could be gotten around. So let's say that we did have that uh, uh, man in the middle attack running and we were able to watch the traffic. So we'd then open the app up, use it as we normally would, and kind of see some of the requests that are going on throughout the app. And so we can see in there, there's a few different things. We have a call to get some items, another put request for when we scanned an items, and some analytics. So let's say if we looked at that request for the get items, Let's say it's a simple endpoint that just returns a list of all the items that are going to be available in the app, uh, having both the title of the item and the EAN of that particular item. And then on that put request, we would see that maybe it had uh, the user ID and a latitude and longitude. That way, we would assume that the server would then be parsing that latitude and longitude and comparing that to the list of the stores and making sure that the user actually is within reasonable range of the store and they're not just sitting at home scanning barcodes. So we also notice that this API has no authentication. So that makes it really, really easy to then uh, go and work with. Uh, we see that there's some analytics in there, but we can probably ignore those because it's not going to be critical to actually uh, doing our attack on there of pretending that we scanned items that we didn't actually scan. Um, so like I said, when we open the app, we get the list of all the products that are there. And we could just iterate over that list and send 10 different put requests, and it would be like we walked around the store scanning everything without having to actually do anything. Uh, we could put this in a cron job and run it every morning, so that way you know that any time you stop by the shop that you'd always have a coupon available for you when you opened up the app. You could do the same thing. You could get your friend's user IDs because those were sent in the clear in there, and so you could set up you know, five different cron jobs and make sure all, all your friends get coupons because you're the generous person that you are. So after we take a look at those routes and we look at that, we start looking at other things. Now we notice that this is a RESTful API. And we like RESTful APIs because the routes are very easily predictable. But the attacker's also really gonna love that too because it's just slash API slash whatever the thing is in there. So we might try and look at some other routes like a get user and put in the user ID to see if we can get some information about ourselves. Or maybe we try something like slash users to see if we could get a list of all the users that have signed up for this app. Then we might check to see if there's documentation available. And this would do two things for us. Not only would it tell us all the routes that are gonna be available to us, but it's also gonna give us some insight into the business logic. For example, the documentation might state that uh, uh, you know, users could only submit 10 put requests in a particular day, and so you wouldn't then bother sending more than 10. Uh, we can also try typing in a route uh, to the API that we know doesn't exist, just mash on the keyboard in there and uh, see if we can get a stack trace or some sort of error page that could reveal what programming language the API was written in or maybe the framework. And then you can then look at that framework's documentation and see if maybe there's some special routes that that particular framework offers that would then give you access to maybe the entire routes list or uh, debugging parameters or other things like that. So like I said, we, we noticed there may have been a route called uh, get user and based on the ID. 
So we wouldn't want someone to just go through and type in every single user ID that's in there. So from on this, it's a good idea to use a rate limiter if this is a particular route that is going to be uh, a valid use for your users. So maybe in this app we have uh, a section where uh, people can view other users and maybe there's a leaderboard uh, that shows all the different users in there. So we might want to be able to have someone uh, view the profile of another user and so they could potentially uh, need to hit that endpoint to get that basic information about the user, such as their name and photo. But we wouldn't want someone to go through and iterate through the entire list, so we would want to install a rate limiter on our application to make sure that users aren't calling that too frequently. We're going to talk about rate limiters, uh, rate limiters a little bit more later. This is also a good case for using UUIDs to look up any sort of record, not just user records. So if we notice that our user ID is 123, there's probably a good chance that there's another record at 124 or 122. But if you use a GUID for that, it makes it much, much more difficult, though still possible, to guess someone else's user ID. And I know with PHP, MySQL is a very popular database to be used, and MySQL makes UUIDs a little bit more difficult than it really should be. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to get rid of your auto-incrementing integers for your primary keys right away. You can store a UUID in a column adjacent to that and still use those uh, indexed as lookups and then uh, internally do your joins based on your integer IDs. So let's say that our, uh, data, or our application code looks something like this. So we have a route for getting users by their ID. And I know this is going to look different in every particular framework, but generally you'll have a controller method in there that would be named based something on the route, and it's going to have a parameter that takes in the ID. And so in this case, uh, it might just pass that ID directly to the database, which is going to perform a select on that, return that as an array or object, which then the framework would then serialize out to JSON or XML or whatever the API happens to use. This is not a very good idea because this means that anyone with any ID can call this and it's going to return all the information that that get user method is going to be in there. It might be a select star and so that could even return uh, a copy of the hashed password because we're all storing password hashed and definitely not in plain text. So a better way to go around this would be to use view model. So in this case, uh, we have the same call to get the user's information. We'll store that in a variable. And next, we're going to look up and see if the currently logged in user is sort of a super user, someone who really should be able to see a lot of information about all the users. And so if it is, we're going to create an instance of this something that we're going to call an admin user response. And this is going to have a list of all the particular keys that that type of user should see in there. So maybe an admin user would have a legitimate use case for seeing the created date for this user record, whereas most other people wouldn't normally have that. So on if you were then, uh, if the current user was the same as the ID of the user that we're looking up, we would still return the same thing, but it may uh, omit some of those keys that the admin user would have. And lastly, if they're not an admin and the user ID does not match, uh, depending on the scope of our application, if it's something where other users do need to see something in there, then you would have uh, maybe another response type which just has a couple of those keys that they absolutely need to see. But if it's something where users don't ever need to see information about each other, then at that point, you would want to return uh, an exception on there and give them an HTTP 400 and say, hey, you're definitely not allowed to look at this. Uh, so by doing this, you can kind of con uh, encapsulate some of your logic into these view models and not have to worry about you know, each particular uh, API endpoint having to check to make sure that the right keys have been redacted. And also tests are something that are really, really, really important to catch some of this because especially when you have new developers on your team, they might need to add a, a data point on one API and they might not recognize that that's also being used on a lot of other things. So if you have tests asserting that your API output is exactly this structure and then all of a sudden there's a new key in there, the test will fail and your developers will know that uh, something is wrong and we don't want to be exposing new data in there. Uh, you do have to be really thorough on this, especially on endpoints that will do something like searching, and you have different query parameters that they could pass in to return different records. Uh, another thing that you can install, uh, this can take place uh, sort of in place of your load balancer or possibly sit between your load balancer and your application, is something called a web application firewall. And what this will do is it's going to look at all the requests coming in and look and see what the user is putting in those requests. And it can catch a lot of the low-hanging fruit uh, for something like SQL injection. Uh, 
because those tend to have some very predictable strings to see that the user is you know, adding semicolons and a quote and then maybe a drop table or something like that. And if it saw something like that that it was able to detect, it would then just completely reject it and it, this request would not even get to your API. Uh, it, it, you know, there is, of course, some limitations to this, and they are only able to react to what they've been trained to react to. So this doesn't mean that it's a substitute for uh, actual good application security in there, in your actual application. So definitely, you know, parameterize your inputs for SQL queries and things like that. But these are really good and at um, catching some very common attacks. And they can also uh, mitigate against the script kitties who will try every single vulnerable, vulnerable URL that has ever been published. Uh, such as looking things are like slash php my admin or uh, uh, WordPress vulnerabilities and things like that. And so that can actually stop things from getting into your application and hopefully make you not have to wake up in the middle of the night for those uh, uh, pager duty alerts. So like I mentioned in this uh, API that we're working at, it didn't have any authentication. So we should probably add that in here. So the first thing you might think of when you think of authentication is either auth basic or auth digest. And these are basically uh, requiring a uh, username and password to be able to make the request. This doesn't actually change the security of anything in the payload. It really just means uh, it's an extra part of the URL that you have to put in there. And so that's not really a secure method, a lot of times also because these are just static usernames and passwords that would be given out to everyone uh, that would be then consuming this. So I would not consider this to be a valid method of authentication for the API. It does mean that anyone who happens to know the URL won't be able to call it unless they have that username and password. But again, it's definitely not very secure. Uh, so a very, very common method for securing APIs would be an API key. And these are usually some sort of static string. And then depending on how things are set up, you might give one to your Android application, another one to your web application. But it's going to be a fixed string in there that's uh, just going to allow anyone with that API key to call pretty much any endpoint for any user's data. Um, in some cases, you might have like a partner or a user key, especially if you're having an internal API or something that's uh, an API that you share with one of your business partners so that they can then access your thing without having to deal with uh, cumbersome authentication. Uh, you might know those as application API keys, especially for mobile web or, or um, uh, mobile apps. Um, but static API keys are incredibly insecure. Because they are very difficult to rotate, it means that anyone who gets one can then call your API as much as they want. And especially if you have those in use on one of your production sites, uh, it would mean that if you then, if someone got a hold of that was making a bunch of malicious re requests, you would not then be able to deactivate that API key because it would also uh, deactivate all your uh, legitimate users who are then using the application. You should consider that an API key is compromised the very first time that you use it. It's very possible that there is an, a proxy server in the middle of someone's request that could cache that URL in there, and then that API key is then going to be part of uh, the server logs on there. Uh, if you're looking for the source code of an application, they're generally very easy to find because uh, they'll be named something like API key. Um, and like I mentioned, they're hard to rotate because uh, once they get out there, they tend to be used over and over and over again for many users at a time. Uh, API keys are also something developers tend to hard code in their code. This is just me going to GitHub and searching for API underscore key, and we have almost 7 million records. Now, I've given this talk before uh, in late 2021, and I had this same screenshot in here, and there were about 4.5 million, so I guess people were re getting really good at committing API keys. Uh, still. So uh, another form of authentication we could use is token authentication. And so what we do is we'll assign a unique string to each user. So when they log in, as soon as we've validated their credentials, we're going to generate some sort of string and we're going to assign that directly to a user. Even better is if we can assign a unique token to each user for each session that they are in. So if they have maybe a web session going and an app session going, they would have different tokens for each of those. Uh, each token is going to have a defined uh, TTL, or time to live, which means that the server is going to know that after a set period of time that that token is no longer going to be valid. The server would be able to revoke or extend that at any time, 
So if we see some suspicious activity with one of these tokens, we could just say, hey, we're going to cut that one off and it's no longer valid. Or maybe if the user ticks the remember me and the, uh, their traffic looks normal, we can, can continue to extend that token uh, for several t um, days or hours at a time. Uh, in a way, we could think of this as a pure user API key. So now when uh, we start getting requests coming in, we can start to identify which user is making the request versus before if we had a static API key, we just know that a user was making a request. So in the infancy of an application, we tend to think of things as, as very simple. You have the API that everybody calls, and you might have a couple of different clients. Once your application starts to grow, you maybe have different APIs that things are reaching out to. And if there's only one server that is managing those user tokens and, note, and keeping track of which ones are valid and which ones are invalid, for example, the, the authorization API might be taking care of that. When the user then calls the search API with that same token, the search API is then going to have to call the authorization API to see, is this token still valid? Now, these milliseconds, of course, add up. And we could uh, try various different things to sort of synchronize the validity of tokens across different services. Uh, but there is a, a more stateless way that we can do this. Uh, sorry, here, and here's an example of how that would do. So a user would call the search API. It would contact the authorization server, which get a response. And the same thing would happen with one of the other APIs. So a more stateless way to do this would be something called a JSON web token, or JOT for short. And so a JOT is just a string that we see here in the box on the left. And it is uh, comprised of all ASCII symbols. And there are three sections to the JOT. The first section is going to be a header, which describes uh, that it is a JOT and the type of algorithm that is used to sign it at the end. The second section is the actual payload of the JOT. And this contains all the pertinent information about the JOT, such as who it's for, how long it's been, how long it is valid for, and maybe who issued that particular JOT. And the last section is going to be the signature of the JOT. So what happens is uh, you can see that these are just JSON strings in here. And to sign that, we're going to uh, do a base64 encoding of those two strings there, concatenate both of those with a period. And then in this case, this particular JOT is using a HMAC SHA-256 signature on there. And it's going to come up with the hash for that particular string. And it will base64 encode that. And then that will be the third section of the job. So what that means is because this has been signed with those particular payloads by the server that issued it, if someone were trying to modify anything in this token, just even one byte in there, that would mean that the signature that would get calculated on it later would then be different. So if a server to, were to accept this and see that the signature that was provided does not match the signature that it recalculates when it receives the JOT, it would know that the JOT has been tampered with, and it would reject it. Uh, also, JOTs always start with EYJ, because that's how a uh, opening curly brace starts off with in uh, base64 encoding. So you can, if you look in your uh, session storage in your browser, you'll often see a lot of these in here. And you'll see uh, that you can then decode this. This particular uh, decoder is a free website, uh, jwt.io. Uh, you can paste JOTs in there. One of the things I like about it, it's all written in JavaScript, so it doesn't actually post your particular token onto a server. And so uh, you can, uh, I use it frequently at work to you know, make sure that uh, things in a JOT are valid without having to reveal personal information to a third party. So with a JOT, just like a user token, we have the identity in that token, so you're going to know exactly who it is that's making a request on there. Another thing is that we could assign these to both uh, logged in users and unknown users. So for example, the first time a user visits the website in the background, we can just give them a jot without a user ID. And so that, that way, we would know that uh, that particular device would be valid for that particular validity period that we assigned in there. And we at least know that it's an unauthenticated user making those requests. Uh, a JOT is going to be time limited. That is one of the requirements for a JOT, is that you have both a uh, timestamp in which the JOT is not valid before, nor is it valid after. And so it really depends on the application and how long these JOTs are going to be valid. Sometimes it can be a couple minutes. Sometimes it can be several hours. Um, in some cases, for a machine-to-machine -machine API, it could even be a few days. The downside about a JOT, though, is that you can't revoke one. So because the JOT itself describes that it is valid, and each particular server that is decoding this is going to look and see if the signature matches and then treat it as valid, uh, 
there's no central authority for anything to go in and look up and see that this particular jot we would consider compromised and we don't want to consider them valid anymore. So this becomes somewhat of a delicate dance where you have to decide a time window that's both short enough that you can keep them uh, not out there for too long, but still long enough to not annoy your users for having to reauthenticate too often. Although I say you cannot revoke one, you can technically revoke them all. Now each jot is signed by a private key that the authorization server would use, and then each of the other servers that you would send that to has a copy of the public key. If you then decide to use a different public key to uh, look at all of those and a new corresponding private key, that would mean that every single one of the jots that's currently valid that's out there would then become uh, uh, invalid. So if you were under heavy attack, this is something you could uh, potentially do to kind of sort of stop the floodgates, at least for a short period of time. Um, but just remember that it is not really possible to revoke a jot. Once it's out there, it's valid. So like I said, when a jot expires, there's a couple things you can do. Um, probably the most popular thing is to just to force them to log back in again, much like if you had an expired cookie. Um, another thing you can do is use a refresh token. And a refresh token is something that is issued by the authorization server at the same time as when the jot is issued. It looks a lot like a jot, but it has a special type of payload that identifies that particular user. The authorization server is going to keep track of the refresh tokens that it has issued, who it is issued to them to, and how long that token should be valid for. So that way, if the client notices that their jot is expired or is very soon to expire, it can then reach out to the authorization server with that refresh token, and the server will then provide it a new jot without their user having to re-authenticate themselves. So also a jot, you can put pretty much anything into it since it is just a JSON object. In this particular one, we're storing the server that authorized it, and it is what I would call an anonymous token because there is no subject or username associated with this. But we notice this key in here called audience, and this will tell the various different servers who this particular jot uh, is valid for. Now, let's say in this application, it's possible for an unauthenticated user to talk to both the search API and the map API but maybe they can't talk to the purchase API because they're not authenticated yet. So because we didn't add that API into this list, we would know that when we sent this particular jot to that server that it would not be uh, valid on that server and that they would need to go and get a new jot for that reason. But just because we have a valid jot, we're kind of running into the same problem again in that we can just continue making requests over and over again. Sure, the company might know who that user is belonging to, but with that same job, we can just call that user 123, 124 again. So is there a way that we could make it to make it harder to get to those particular requests? And in the same way that we can sign a jot, we could also sign a request. So we'd use that same HMAC method to actually sign the payload that the user would be sending up to the API. So for example, if we were to have this same get user call, uh, inside the application, you might have an API key and an app ID. The app ID would uh, probably be uh, something limited to a specific installation of the app or, or a specific version of it. So that would change every time there's a new update in there. And so once we had that request in there, uh, on the client side, it would then take these same things and sign them and come up with a signing code. The server would get that same request. It would take the three inputs, the uh, URL, API key, and app ID, and it would run that through the same algorithm and make sure it gets the same thing. So that way, if someone tried to change it to get users 124, it would not be a valid request, and we would consider this secure. Uh, this is a very, very common use case with static resources, um, especially images. And uh, usually what happens is the uh, server would then be signing this uh, URL instead of the app itself. So if you've ever looked uh, closely at an uh, Instagram image, you'll notice that it has a signature in the URL and a uh, expiration timestamp. And so before uh, allowing anyone to access that image, the server is going through and calculating that signature and giving it out to the user. And this, uh, I think, will prevent a lot of hot linking for uh, Instagram images. And so it means that after uh, a certain period of time, that URL is no longer going to be valid, and the user is going to have to re-authenticate with the API or the web page that generated it to get a copy of the new URL. 
So if we are doing this on the client side, it does mean that it is possible for someone to go and find that signing key so that they could potentially go and you know, sign more requests for the different URLs that they might want to access for. So if you have access to the app's source code, which you would in a browser, and potentially could if you were able to get it through the mobile app, uh, you could just look around the source code for that API key. Um, in the web browser, you could set a breakpoint just before it makes that HTTP request, and you could kind of see a stack trace of how we got there, and you might be able to find that method uh, that does contain that key. Uh, another fun one to do would be to look at the app's console, like the developer console and the web tools, but also uh, mobile apps do log out to a, another sort of device console that is very easy to get access to and also very noisy on mobile web, uh, mobile devices. Um, and sometimes, you know, developer, as, as they're troubleshooting, they put debug statements in there, then forget to take them out before the app goes to production. So you could have the signing key leaked there. Uh, another way around this is to make the signing key dynamic. So that's not just a static key for every single app in the instance. Uh, because this is something that would be calculated rather than declared, it makes it a lot more difficult to find in the code because you're not just searching for a string, you're having to find an actual implementation of some sort of method or a class. Uh, you would need this to be a, a deterministic algorithm so that the server can then duplicate the same thing. So as an example, we might take the string length of some class that's part of our application, concatenate that to the version number of the app, and then the uh, date and hour of uh, the timestamp in UTC. And so that way, every hour and every version that the app is updated, this signing key would then be uh, changing and regenerated. Uh, also, like I said, that we might have access to the source code. Uh, you could connect an app to a debugger. And in the browser's JavaScript console, this is quite easy to do. Um, but it is also still possible for a mobile app, even if you don't have the source code to it. Um, Android apps also are very easy to decompile and actually decompile quite readable if they're written in Java or Kotlin to the point where you can see all the class names. Uh, sometimes they, they do get obscured a little bit, but you can at least see all the methods that are being called and some of the source code that is in there. Um, this does work on iOS too. Uh, I don't have any experience doing that, but I know that that is one of the things that uh, is really popular amongst jailbroken devices. So rather than trying to have and sign all our keys uh, from the app, we could instead proxify all our calls to the API so that our app only has one secret instead of many different secrets to talk to different APIs. We would then have the proxy verify that secret, and then it itself would reach out to the other actual APIs on the user's behalf. This is especially useful if you're integrating with third-party APIs. Uh, for example, on Google Maps' geolocator, they're going to give you a static API key that is going to be used throughout your application. And uh, anyone who then had access to that API key could then continue to call that API. And that could potentially cost you money in the long run because each of those APIs calls are, uh, have a cost associated with them. So by processing that through, you're not actually exposing the API key to any of your app users. And it also makes it easier to rotate if, for example, that key got compromised on GitHub again. But it does still mean that we are dealing with a secret. So is there a way that we can have an app work without a secret in it? I promised an OAuth 2 flow in, in uh, the abstract, so here we go. So we start off with our app, which would then make an authorization request to an OAuth 2 service. This would be an authorizing the user type of request. That would then talk to our API gateway, which then talks to our auth service, which would validate that the user is good, send them back, and they would get an auth token. From there, we would authorize the app. And by this, I mean the sort of dynamic instrumentation check and seeing that the app is running in an unmodified environment. We would do some checks on that to make sure everything is hunky-dory there, and then they would come back with an app token. So now, the mobile environment just has these two tokens that are not stored on the device at all, but could then be used to make API calls through the API gateway to all of our APIs that are then proxied behind it. And so in this, you say we're authorizing both who and what, the user and the app, instead of just one. Uh, the token that it would be returning would be something very short-lived, so that uh, you know, we would be able to monitor the, the continuing uh, usage of those and how often they are being um, uh, generated. And although I do say OAuth 2 in there, and that is typically used for user authentication, 
Uh, don't think about this so much as that, but so more of an access token generator. Also, because all of our APIs are proxied behind that one proxy, it means that we can rotate all of our secrets without having to issue any updates for our mobile apps. And that API gateway, of course, can do some rate limiting and authentication checks for us, thus uh, meaning our applications have a lot less to worry about, and they can concentrate on just dealing with the API calls that they have to deal with. So sometimes you have endpoints that can't necessarily have authentication. So I can think of maybe a website that has a, uh, a storefront on it, and users can go and browse the catalog in there. Obviously, you don't often want users to have to log in to be able to browse the products that are for sale. Uh, so you wouldn't want to have you know, authentication required on that. But that doesn't mean that the API should just accept any old request without any sort of authentication. Like I mentioned before, when the uh, user first visits the website, we could give them an anonymous jot, and then we can have some information about who that went out to. Uh, we can also do rate limiting on these APIs that can't have any authentication. And uh, this is another one of those rare instances where we actually have some insight into an, in, an attack that would happen. And this was back in 2018, and T-Mobile had to admit that about 2 million of their customers were subject to a data breach. And we noticed in here a couple of key things that the cybersecurity team detected, which means that they had a rate limiter on this particular API, and someone was monitoring it, or there was some automation around it that noticed, hey, we're getting an unusually high number of requests to this particular API. Someone needs to look at it. So in the middle of that, they were able to shut it down, so only 3% of their users were actually leaked instead of the 100% that could have been. So like I said, monitoring is a very important part to that to make sure that even if your uh, authentication is compromised, that it's not going too far. You can use some heuristics based on these to uh, kind of see how often requests are coming in to see you know, does this traffic look really similar to some other traffic just because maybe some parts of it have changed. Uh, often rate limiting is based on an IP address, and so uh, an attacker will get access to some proxy servers to then um, you know, kind of get around that, so it'll make requests coming through several different places, which is the foundation of a DDoS attack. Uh, so you might want to look at um, uh, how similar the requests are to each other, uh, time between requests, and um, maybe some information about them, uh, like where that IP is coming from. Uh, and again, I mentioned API gateways. Some of these uh, can do this out of the box. So maybe you've heard too much about APIs and you say, we're not going to do this anymore. Just having JSON endpoints out there is just way too much for us to handle, and people are just going to use that and see that as a, a thing to attack. So we're just going to go back to straight web pages and have everything available there. Well, our old friend curl is still of use here, and with a couple of curl calls and some regular expressions, we could probably extract some information out of any web page. So you think, okay, we will put it static in the HTML. Maybe we'll put some JavaScript around it, and we'll really obfuscate it so that they have to actually load the page in a browser to do it. Well, what we can do then is we could use Symfony Panther or some of the other browser testing devices, and with it, just a couple lines of code, we could log into that service and then read some text on the web page. And you say, well, we have a CAPTCHA on the login page. We're not going to get robots logging in. Well, I was actually floored when I found out that there are actually APIs where you can send in the CAPTCHA and it will solve it for you. Um, they're kind of hush-hush about how this works. Some of them, will, uh, some of the more simpler ones will do uh, optical character recognition and sort of read the text in there. Um, some of them, you know, when you have to choose the buses or the bicycles, they might use some AI to try and get around that. Um, but I know that some of them still actually use humans that will sit there and just, they're waiting for a request to come in, and they will click the things for you and then send back the token that you would then forward back on to get around that CAPTCHA. So in conclusion, just remember that dumping a database through an API is significantly easier than trying to hack into someone's service and, and dump their database over SSH. So that means that your APIs are going to be probably the primary attack vector that someone's going to look at to get access to your data. If they want it bad enough, they're going to try hard enough to get it. So we talked about several different methods, methods for authenticating, especially with a double-legged OAuth 2 flow. That might be very complex for something that's not really that valuable and might not be worth implementing. Definitely only want to reveal what the current user needs to see. If they shouldn't see someone else's data, don't let them access other person's data. Don't use static authentication like API keys. Uh, debug protection and code obfuscation can thwart semi-determined hackers. 
So I know that we talked about the request signing in there. Uh, there was one that I saw that uh, someone had put the AES algorithm in JavaScript. It was very heavily uh, obfuscated and packed in there. And I ran through it with a debugger, and I think after about 10 steps, I realized that I didn't actually want access to this API anymore, and that they had uh, sufficiently thwarted me from uh, trying to get access to that. And in where it's possible, you can authenticate uh, the app and the environment, as well as just the user themselves, so you can see where your requests are coming from. If you want some more information about this, uh, the OWASP API Security Top 10 is an excellent resource for talking about everything that we talked about here and more. Uh, they put it in much more jargony terms. For example, I think it's, um, I don't even remember the acronym, uh, a broken object level authorization, I think is uh, the term that they use for user A can see user B's data. Um, so this is a uh, list of uh, things to watch out for that was released in 2019. And interestingly, I note that as of two days ago, they've started writing the 2023 edition. So definitely watch this space. Uh, if you're more of a book person, there's a Hacking APIs book by Corey Ball, which is available on No Starch Press. Uh, he definitely talks about the OWASP Pot 10. It's going to break it down into much more user-friendly terms than the, the jargony uh, OWASP list will. Uh, Port Swigger, who develops an application called the Burp Suite, has, an a, has a web security academy, uh, free online training with some labs that you can do. And you can actually see a lot of these methods in place and actually uh, replicate them on your local machine without having to uh, you know, go and attack someone else's API. Uh, and if you're more interested in some of the sort of app dynamic integrity checks, I would take a look at the uh, OWASP, uh, let's call that Envasis rules on there that talk about how that's implemented. With that, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. We have a mic. solution that you would use or <laughs> so I'll repeat the question for the live stream uh, <laughs> asking if I have a recommended capture solution yeah uh, I don't okay. um, <laughs> I think if you're worried about people automated by uh, like automated bypass of them I would go out and look at several of the popular API's that will then do the solving for you and see what they support like some of them might support H captcha but not the Google captcha and so then you might think that the Google one uh, could be more secure Hi. Uh, so what do you think about um, as uh, the JOT uh, isn't possible to revoke to um, let a user authenticate and get like a JOT, like for example, over OpenID Connect and then replace it for like API calls with a self-generated key which you can revoke. So like so it's almost like you would be hashing your jot and and making that an api key is that mm, in a roundabout way yes n not necessarily but okay. yeah not necessarily hashing but still using something based on the jot to use that as an api key yeah i would say as long as you can then uniquely identify that that key is one particular user or instance or installation then you're effectively accomplishing the same thing okay Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Right, thanks for the talk. Um, so you talked about not encoding API key and, and sending that because obviously you can sniff uh, the API key and then you can use it. But if you use auth2, you have to obviously create the token, and then you pass the bearer token in the header. So it's kind of the same thing anyways. It's just instead of having API key in, I don't know, URL, you have a bearer token in the header, and you can still, still send that out, and doesn't change anything in the end. True. It really depends on what you put inside that header. And so there's nothing in the spec that says that a bearer token has to be a JOT or any sort of token that is time limited. You could put a static API key in there. Uh, so the important part would be something that's not given out to multiple users so that anyone could then grab it and use it for whatever they want. 
that answer the question? Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.